Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Objective. Uh, today, we are discussing David Attenborough. Uh, those of you in the UK know him. He's a, he's a very famous figure. He's a, um, a documentary filmmaker. Sorry, that is YouTube telling me that we're going live. Uh, and he is a, a famous environmentalist who will be celebrating his 95th birthday tomorrow. So to um, mark his birthday, let's, let's call it that, I am joined by uh, Don Watkins. Uh, he is the author of several books, uh, including Equal is Unfair. He is uh, a, um, he's a host with uh, James Valiant of our Wednesday uh, discussions of Ayn Rand's essays. And he is director of education at the Center for Industrial Progress. Uh, Don, hi, how's it going? Hey, good to see you, man. So um, David Admiral, I don't think he's as big a, a figure in the US, uh, although his ideas uh, are, are, I think, uh, quite prevalent there as well. Um, but th there are some statements that he has made that we, I think, will uh, will mention a few of uh, on today's show that really, um, you know, makes you wonder, uh, first of all, why he is uh, a, a sort of a national treasure in the UK, and also uh, makes you wonder how, how much of a... Uh, practicable uh, ideology environmentalism is. So uh, do you have any initial thoughts on uh, David Attenborough from, from what you know, what you recently read? Well, I mean, in one sense, he totally is a natural, a national treasure. That is, it's a huge value to human beings to understand the natural world, to get up close to things that we've never seen and experienced before. And he was really a pioneer like uh, people who are my generation and younger, you know, maybe the um, what was his uh, Steve, Steve Irwin, like you were much more uh, associated with somebody like him. But Attenborough was, you know, the original person who brought us all over the globe and showed us these real treasures. But I think you have to distinguish that from the kind of ideology that he mouths, which is a really anti-human one. Because the way I think about it is that in order to appreciate nature, first of all, you have to be able to survive. For most of human history, we lived, quote, you know, at peace with nature, in harmony with nature. And that's why we died at 30. Like a person who has to be farming full time in the hopes of eking out a survival is not going to be going around and looking at, oh, that's a really cute hippo. But it's only once you have capitalism, industrial civilization, industrial level energy that people can start to say, hey, I have the time, I have the wealth in order to look around and really appreciate the rest of the world. And I think it's very common for people who love animals, who love nature to elevate that and take for granted what's required for human beings to be able to enjoy it. So I think he mouths a really awful ideology and we should talk about that. Um, but that one of the real failures I think has been the package dealing, the putting together and, and um, treating as equivalent love of the natural world with opposition to human transformation of the world. And I think those two actually go together and shouldn't be severed. Uh, yeah, and uh, I will <clears throat> I will thank Super Chatters here uh, rather than in the chat. So thank you, uh, Jeff. And um, yeah, I, I so for me, something that just strikes me every single time and especially in with with somebody like David Attenborough is um, how is the distance between the you know expressed ideas and uh, the the choices that the person makes when it comes to their own life so I, I uh, looked up his net worth I think it's something like 30 something million pounds uh, but he he says we need to curb the excesses of, of capitalism he um, you know, uh, he, he says humans are a plague on earth. And, you know, this is, um, he, you know, he, he has certain ideas about how to make uh, the world a better place as, as do we, and, you know, much, you know, much like, much like him, uh, we take certain action to, to uh, promote our ideas and uh, the world we'd like to see. Uh, 
but I do think very often with environmentalists, and again with David Attenborough, it's it's uh, it's clearly visible. Um, he has to act uh, against his his expressed views. Um, so curbing the excesses of capitalism would mean we wouldn't get those those beautiful shots of of uh, you know the natural world which we have in his documentaries, which by the way are, are great to watch. Uh, it's just when you think of uh, of who is. Uh, narrating them uh, and, and what his ideas are, that it, it comes a bit troubling. And um, well, there's two, I, I think there's two things to get about how he's thinking about the world. One is the kind of goal. What's the ideal in his view? And then there's what well, you can think about the mental model of how the world works. So let's start with the mental model, which is um, I think about it as the consumption view of the world, which is that the way that human beings survive, the way that all animals survive is that there's stuff around them and then they consume it. And most of nature has the good graces to only consume like a, a an amount that's sort of bounced with everything around them, right? So nothing ever gets out of whack. And then their view of human beings is that we're these kind of like unleashed consumers who just gobble up all of the resources, all of the things around us, destroy, pollute, and are parasites on the world around us. And because that's reached a level that's unhinged, that's unsustainable. And that is really destructive to the planet. And if you have that view, then it's not insane to think, well, like this isn't going to continue. And so he has, he has this idea that like as population grows and as we continue to use up resources, nature is going to fight back. Nature is basically going to say like, you can't continue in this way. But if you actually think about the real way in which human beings survive, it's not by gobbling up a whole bunch of resources that are just kind of splattered around us. It's by creation. It's by transforming the world for the betterment of human life. So, I mean, take something like the tech revolution. What do we, what's the place in the United States where that is kind of like the centerpiece? It's Silicon Valley. Silicon is basically, I mean, it's essentially sand. It's taking this worthless, plentiful material and finding a way to make it useful or take something like oil. Here's glop sitting under the ground that you that people in um, past decades used to think was a nuisance. Like we're trying to drill for water and we keep getting this black garbage, we're like get this out of the way. And we found a way to make it enormously useful. And that is really the mode of human survival. It's value creation, not consumption. And when you think about, okay, if we can use our minds to transform the things around us, the raw materials of nature into resources, and we can find new ways to create resources, then there's no such idea as we're just gobbling up the things around us and eventually it has to turn into disaster. No, there's no reason why we can't continue to find creative ways to make the universe valuable to us. Then the second aspect that you have to think is what is his goal? What's his ideal? What should we be aiming at? And I think Attenborough falls into the category that many people do, which is that the ideal is untouched nature. It's wilderness. It's the idea of minimizing our impact on the planet. And my view is that, no, we need to maximize our positive impact on the planet. What I'm concerned with is human life, human flourishing, the ability of human beings to live long, enjoyable, successful lives. And from that perspective, sometimes our impact on nature is good. And sometimes it's bad. It's bad when it hurts human beings. And that can include all sorts of things. If you create so much deadly pollution from, say, an energy process that it undermines all the benefits of that energy process, that's a bad thing. You don't want to do that. You want to minimize those side effects. Um, but if you're transforming nature for the positive, if your impact on the planet is benefiting human lives. So if you look, for example, at China and there's definitely been an increase in air pollution over the last 30 years, but you've also seen an even more outsized increase in human lifespans. That is, whatever the side effects of our transforming nature using um, coal, particularly in China, it is so overwhelmed by the benefits of that process that it's not even a question. Like that, in my view, is a positive transformation of nature. Now, ideally, you can find better ways to minimize the side effects. And if you look at the U.S., for instance, we've been able to have increasing energy use with, incre with decreasing air pollution, decreasing side effects. But that is not how somebody like Attenborough thinks about it. Their goal is untouched nature. It's not 
improving nature for human beings. It's protecting nature from human beings. And that is a really anti-human view. And I think something that should be opposed. And um, I understand how somebody who, you know, we live in a division of labor economy. And if your whole focus is on gorillas and plants in the jungle and so on, you can see how somebody would think, hey, you guys out there are trampling on my beloved things. Um, but if you really take seriously what that means, it's entirely monstrous. Look, I mean, the fact is he couldn't do what he did if he didn't have airplanes and vehicles to take him out to these places in nature. If he didn't have cameras powered by batteries, powered by electrical plants, um, none of that appreciation of nature would be possible. So it's a really bad ideology and I think needs to be opposed by a pro-human ideology. Yeah, and I see that Mary Lane uh, in the chat asked, if, if humans are a plague, where does he fit? Uh, is, he, is he an exception? Which is, which is pretty much my, my question around it. But I also don't want to sort of straw man it and, and say, okay, you know, if he's an environmentalist, if he wants to be fully consistent, you know, he should uh, you know, go you know, uh, relieve the earth of his presence. Uh, but well, I view it, I view it the other way. So there is a hypocrisy there. It's inherent. Any view that basically says human beings are a plague, there is a real hypocrisy. Now they can whitewash it by saying, well, look, I'm devoting my efforts to trying to teach us how to be less of a plague or something like that. Um, but my view is the exact opposite, which is not, oh, he should be consistent with his ideology and stop using electricity and stop flying on planes. It's he should stop advocating an anti-human ideology. That's like, that's what I object to. Yeah, he should fly on planes. Yeah, he should produce nature documentaries. Yeah, he should use a lot of energy. He should keep earning a fortune. All of that is to the good. What the, the bad side of the hypocrisy is precisely the ideas that he's advocating. Yeah, and um, uh, thanks, Bonnie and Jonathan, for the uh, super chats. Yeah, there was there was a story in in uh, the British media, an, an interview with him a couple of days ago, which was, uh, you know, it's it's quite heartbreaking. He's talking about how he he lost his wife and how you know he, he it's it's lonely, you know, having dinner alone, and so on. And um, I, I remember. Uh, it, Battle of Ideas, which is a, a weekend long conference here uh, in London every year. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a panel on environmentalism where uh, another, uh, an environmentalist speaker, uh, there, there were two environmentalists. There was somebody from the Green Party and that was the more moderate environmentalist. The other one um, said that the human population uh, should be reduced by, by a third. So, uh, yeah, the, you know, this is an this is an argument that um, we hear a lot, and I also I also think you know it it, it would be great if environmentalists uh, you know preached uh, what they often practice, which is uh, uh, you know living a human life on Earth. Uh, I'm sure they you know buy um, carbon what do they call it uh, carbon credits. Oh, sense. Yeah. But but. Uh, but ultimately, they, they do choose that. I've, I've had many conversations with environmentalists where, where they talk about you know, the, the abstract ideas and, and in between they tell me about their uh, next holiday. So how do, we, how do we bridge that context and how do we uh, tell them, you know, keep doing what you're doing, but except for the, uh, the advocacy part, which you know, clearly doesn't work for you. So maybe it's, it's not... It's not the best ideas to advocate. Well, I mean, to the actual like hardcore environmentalists who are like on an anti-human premise, I think there's nothing to say to them. If somebody doesn't value human life, if their goal is not human flourishing, then I don't think there's any argument that's going to persuade them because what are you going to appeal to? Like what value you're going to say, oh, you're letting this down. No, it's only if you value human flourishing. The people that I'm interested in speaking to are the people who value human beings and who value human life and who value their own life and yet have accepted this idea that there's something good and ideal about untouched nature, about minimizing our impact on the planet. Because I don't think those people are anti-human, though they have accepted an anti-human idea by implication. And I think what you have to do is show those people two aspects of the same issue. 
that you have to show them number one that there is something really anti-human about the idea of minimizing your impact on nature. And then two, you have to show them that the things that they're legitimate that they care about fall under the goal of human flourishing. So it's if you love nature, that is a human goal. That's a, a human experience that can be really pleasurable. Human health is a huge value. Enjoying seeing these species that are not something you just stumble upon when you're walking through Central Park. Like those are real values, but they're only values and they're only achievable on a uh, human flourishing framework. And so I think that it's the people who really do value human life, but value it inconsistently. If they don't, then no, then you should wipe out human beings. If human, if, if our, our goal is untouched nature, if our goal is minimize human impact on the planet, then no, absolutely. You should go out and destroy human beings. I mean, you should rob them of energy, rob them of wealth, prevent their ability to transform the world. And there are really people who believe that. And I mean, we could explore why that is. I think it's more a psychological issue in many ways. Um, but there is a real view like that. And thankfully, it's not held by a great deal of people. But the people who do hold it have had enormous sway uh, historically in the realm of ideas. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mary Aline, for the super chat. And uh, Jonathan says in the chat, uh, looking at Don and Razi, I am reminded that Rand hated facial hair. Well, Jonathan, uh, I, I can't speak for Don, but I am reducing my carbon footprint by not uh, removing the facial hair. And, well, it's uh, also, I, I'm not trying to please Ayn Rand, so. Yeah. Um, and and he also he also adds I think she would love these two however um, well uh, before we move over to Clubhouse uh, so there was a video on um, on the uh, Ayn Rand Center UK uh, social media recently where Nikos and I were talking and then you uh, claimed that we can up our game which I, I don't see how that could possibly be done. Uh, but do you, uh, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? And, uh, we can tell people what is coming up soon for members of the Ayn Rand Center UK. I mean, this is one of the things I am most excited about right now that's on my agenda. So, um, you know, I, oh, I, like I struggled to learn communication. I had kind of a basic ability to string words together in a, in a, you know, kind of clear, interesting way. Uh, but in terms of really being able to make my ideas clear and compelling, and certainly when it came to speaking, any form of verbal communication or oral communication, I mean, I had trouble ordering a Subway sandwich, you know, it was like hems and haws and so on. And I had the great benefit of being able to spend years and years full time working with some of the best communicators and some of the best communicating communication teachers. And so I've always been, I've thought about a lot for the last few years, but particularly the last year of, well, how can I make that available to people on a wide scale? And I hadn't really come up with an idea that I was satisfied by. And you guys came to me and said, Hey, we want to help people up their communication game. And, you know, this is something I've worked on for a long time and I've helped a lot of people with. But basically the idea here is that anyone who wants to participate can become a member of Iron Center UK and then join us for classes where the heart and soul of it will do different things. But the real core of it is that people will give kind of short speeches, mock interviews, occasionally a piece of writing, and then... I'm going to give them the kind of feedback that helped me go from where I was to where I am. And there's really no substitute for that. One of the things we're going to encourage people to do is listen to uh, Leonard Peikoff's objective communication course, you know, maybe watch some of the videos I've given in the theory. But at the end of the day, there's no substitute for people who are giving you feedback on what you do. If you just think about any skill set, you know, I'm a big baseball fan, but you don't have to be a baseball fan to follow this example. Um, you could watch YouTube videos on how to swing a bat, but there's no substitute for having like Mike Trout sit down with you and say, hey, your elbow's too low or you're swinging, you know, in a, in a way, with your weight on your one foot in the wrong way. You want that individualized feedback. 
And then you want to also be able to see other people getting individualized feedback. You know, the other thing that was helpful to me was that I would be able to read something or listen to a mock talk by somebody else. I'd be able to come up with my own view of, is this good? Is this bad? What are its positives? What are its weaknesses? And then I'd be able to hear experts like Ankar Gatte or Alex Epstein or Greg Salmieri or Yaron Brook give their feedback. And then I'd be able to go, oh, I didn't see that. Why didn't I see that? And so you, that's something else that the students are going to be able to do when, when it's other people's work being critiqued. So I, I think it's going to be, um, uh, to be frank, one of the most valuable things for people who want to become uh, good communicators. And, you know, typically if you want access to like an expert in objectivism, who's going to give you this kind of feedback, you have to, you know, have a full-time job at a place like the Ayn Rand Institute or be an OAC student or, you know, pay 300 bucks for a class. And this is going to be, you know, I don't know what your minimum requirements are and you, you can tell people that, but, you know, if you support Ayn Rand Center UK's efforts, um, you'll be able to do this as long as you're a supporter and as long as I still am involved, which uh, I hope to be for a really long time. Yeah, and I, I was going to ask you for feedback for my performance here, but I think that would be a members only perk. So uh, uh, yeah, memberships start at 10 pounds a, a month, which is around 12 or $13. I don't know what the exact exchange rate is today. Um, and you also, and this would be weekly sessions starting May 27th, every Thursday at uh, 8 p.m. UK time. You also get a weekly session on Leonard Peikoff's courses. Uh, with Nikos and with James Valiant. You get weekly sessions on Rand's fiction. Um, you get a monthly productivity hub. So there's there are many reasons um, to, to become a member. And um, I want to thank a few other super chatters, Mary Aline for an additional super chat, Jonathan and uh, Jeff. Uh, one, of the, one of the people you mentioned there was uh, Alex Epstein. Uh, Jeff says, <clears throat> Looking forward to Alex Epstein's new book, Halfway Through the Moral Case for Fossil Fuels Now, Great Perspective. And um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, um, I've read that book and look forward to the next one. And uh, thank you, Don, for joining me today. Uh, we will uh, move over to Clubhouse. We'll be back on YouTube with uh, Seth Levine for the Integrating Investor in about an hour and a half. And two hours later, um, the next episode of The Psychology of Atlas Shrugged Characters, Dagny Tagger, uh, part two. So thank you everybody for joining us. By the way, mem membership, I didn't post a link, but it is einrandcenter.co.uk slash membership. Uh, so thank you everybody and see you again soon.